Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pray First Conversation. We have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. Hashtag live if you're joining during the 7 o'clock hour, Central Standard Time, that is here in the United States. Hashtag recorded if you're joining at any other time, and hashtag shared and get this out on your pages. That's live, recorded, shared. Live means you're here at 7 o'clock on today, which is Tuesday, February the 7th. Recorded means you're not during the 7 o'clock hour. And shared means that you will think about putting this out on your page and letting your friends and family know that they can come be a part of Pray First Monday through Thursday and on Friday, the Bible Project. Let me give you a real quick update on the Bible Project. If you're saying, well, what is the Bible Project? The Bible Project is a project where we took the initiative to get these stainless steel time capsules and put a Bible in it, and we are placing them in the ground in 50 states of the United States of America. I am very pleased to announce to you guys today that all 50 states have been covered. All of them have not been uh, put in the ground yet, but they all have representatives. 64% of the United States, every 64% uh, uh, of the states have one in the ground at this moment. That is outstanding. And by April the 1st, we're going to have all 50 states covered. We're also including some other Bible things, trying to get the written Word of God into the hands of people everywhere for today and for the future. Remember, Pray First is not just a conversation that we have Monday through Friday here on the Pastor Doug Page Facebook, but it is also a principle that we give God the first of our day, the first of our week, the first of our month, the first of our year, and we give God the first of everything because when God's in first place, everything else can fall into order. When God's not in first place, nothing will be in order. Hit the hearts, hit the likes. Go crazy on those. And as you see the hearts, check that out. As you see the hearts, look at my shirt. As you see the hearts and you see the thumb emojis going up the side of your page there, that is for all of you first-time guests. We're so glad that you're here. Good morning, Deborah. Good morning, Barbie. Good morning, Dustin. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Anita. Good morning, Tasha. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Nicole. We're going to continue talking about grace, and today I'm going to deliver some shocking truth about grace that's going to be a little hard uh, for us to comprehend. It's a little hard for me. It's going to be a little difficult for you. Uh, because I know myself, um, and I know my experience with God, and I know uh, my experience with the church and the Word. Uh, so the shocking truth about grace this morning is probably going to be a little overwhelming, but uh, uh, Candy Warren says I'm not good at typing and listening. I understand. That's why I'm not typing. I'm not good at typing and talking. Um, so it, it can be difficult to grasp the grace is overwhelming. Grace is overwhelming. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5, kind of pick up what we, a little bit what we talked about yesterday. We're going to read verses 16 through 23, and this is Paul speaking. Remember yesterday he said, the things I want to do, I find myself not doing. The things I do not want to do, I find myself doing. It's become predictable that I am broken and that I need saving. In, in chapter 7 of Romans, he says, who will save me? from this body of death. And in Romans 8, he answers the question and says it will be the Holy Spirit through the grace of Jesus Christ. So Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 23 says this, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. How many of you um, are sinners? <laughs> uh, how many of you struggle in an area of your life? Not all areas. I mean, you know, we're not doing the some of the big things, but, you know, some areas. How many of you struggle? Hashtag yep, yep. Uh, and there seems to be a particular area that you can't get victory in in your life. And you don't like what you're doing or not doing. It's a struggle. Matter of fact, you may even despise it. It may be shameful, it may be hurtful, it may be condemning, it might be, uh, it's just something that, that you struggle with. Listen, people argue all the time about what was Paul's thorn in the flesh, and they go straight to his blindness. Can I tell you, 
We know for a fact what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. It was his flesh. Paul wasn't talking about his eyes any more than he was talking about his gallbladder. He was talking about his struggle with sin. Paul was talking about his struggle with brokenness. Paul was talking about his struggle with parts of him being in love with God and parts of him not being in love with God. Parts of him being in love with God's word, parts of him not being in love with God's word. Paul was talking about his struggle with parts of him loving God's way and parts of him not loving God's way. Paul's thorn in his flesh was his flesh. It was sin. It wasn't his eyes. It wasn't his intestines. Paul didn't have a kidney stone. He was not talking about his ailments. He was talking about his spiritual shortcomings. And he's talking about there is this dichotomy inside of us that there's part of me that does and part of me that doesn't. And he says, so I'm just going to break it down like this. Walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Which law? The law of sin and death. Now the works of the flesh, and now he's going to talk about four categories of works of the flesh, and we're going to make those clear this morning. He talks about four categories of our default settings as broken human beings. Now the works of the flesh are evident, and they are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresy, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, dissension, heresies, I'm just kind of going back, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Coming back. But the fruit of the Spirit, now he's going to, uh, he's going to give you another side. The fruits of the Spirit contradict the works of the flesh. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against these, there is no law. Four kinds of sin that Paul talks about in Galatians 5, 16 through 21. Number one, Paul talks about sexual sin. He talks about sexual sin first. We're talking about four categories. And in those that category, sexual sin, he talks about adultery. He talks about fornication. He talks about uncleanliness. And he talks about lewdness. I want you to know that Paul throws in lewd jokes as much as sexual sin as adultery. He throws in uncleanliness uh, as much as a sexual sin as fornication. He puts them in the same thing. So to tell a lewd joke would be just as much missing the mark as committing adultery. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, I'm sure that's what the Pharisees thought when Jesus looked at them and said, uh, you've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that if you've even looked at a woman with lust, that you are an adulterer. So, let's check that one off. We're all sinners. The second um, uh, group of sin that he talks about is emotional sin. Emotional sin. Did you know that there is emotional sin? Did you know that you can sin emotionally? Do you know some of you, the thing that you can't get past is that you have a broken emotional system that causes you to respond and react against and towards and about people in ways that is ugly and unrighteous and not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let me say this real quick. If it's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit, it's the fruit of someone else. You cannot walk away from one thing and not be walking towards another. There is not only the fruit of the Spirit, but there is also the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Let's talk about emotional sin and what did he list in this category? Hatred, contention, jealousy, 
outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, envy, dissension, and murder. He put, listen to me, he put jealousy and envy in the same category with murder. You say, that's ridiculous. Well, let's look at Cain and Abel. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because God rejected him, but he accepted Abel. He was envious. He was murderous. He had hatred. Do you know that he puts jealousy and dissension and murder in the same category with hatred? You know, you say, well, this is crazy. We say, I've never murdered anybody. Jesus said that he who hates his brother is guilty of murder. So we're two for two. We are sexually impure. We are emotionally impure. Some of you are dealing with terrible envy, terrible jealousy, terrible hatred, and you just cannot get outside yourself for comparing yourself to someone else and judging yourself, and therefore you are self-condemning. The third group of sin category that he talks about here in Galatians chapter 5 is the sins of excess. He talks about drunkenness and revelries. He talks about drunkenness and revelries. And then the fourth uh, category of sin that he talks about here is spiritual. And he's talking about idolatry, sorcery, and heresy. So the four categories of sin that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5 is sexual, emotional, sins of excess, and spiritual sins. But I also want to throw this in there. He throws drunkenness in there with murder. He throws uh, sorcery in there with envy. He throws lewdness in there with adultery. He throws contention in there with selfish ambition. He throws fornication in there with drunkenness. All of these are in different categories, but he's talking about the default brokenness of mankind because we are in fact sinners. You need to embrace this deep down in your soul. You are not going to be fixed until you stand with God. You're not going to change until you're in the presence of the changer. You're not going to uh, be right, be well. This, this might even be more shocking. You will never be good until you are with God because God is good. We are sinners. God is whole. I am broken. If you fixed a hundred things in your life a day, listen to this. If you were to fix or God would change a hundred things in your life a day for 60 years, you would be a broken sinner. So if your hope is in being fixed, you are going to be gravely disappointed. When, when we do not walk in the Spirit, Paul says, these are the four categories of things we walk in by default. It's, it's the way we lean. It is our bent. Uh, that it takes an effort and it takes the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to, to change me in any of these areas. These things happen by default when our flesh leads. Do you know why you feel so... Uh, chaotic sometimes, so divided sometimes, internal chaos so often, it's because your soul is fighting your spirit for control. And your flesh is fighting your spirit for control. Your soul and flesh are fighting your spirit for control. Your spirit is fighting your soul and your soul is fighting your body. You are, you are in inner turmoil. Paul says, who can save me from this body of death in chapter 7? And in verse, in chapter 8, he says, it will be the Holy Spirit through the grace of Jesus Christ. Who can save me from this body of death? Well, it will be the grace of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, so knowing how broken we are, how many of you would agree? You're, you're messed up. Kelly, Tasha, Larry, Neil, Raymond, uh, Dustin, Stevie, Brandy, Ann. Uh, Barbie, Joanne, uh, how many of you would agree that you are royally messed up? You are broken. Let me tell you something. If you think you need Jesus, you're not saved. 
those of us who have been born again know we need Jesus. We don't think we need Jesus. We, we, didn't, we didn't need Jesus. We still need Jesus. Every day, every moment, every second, my salvation, my uh, being born again, my forgiveness, my strength, my power, anything good that happens in my life is because of my need for and his granting of his presence to me. Cindy, we are royally messed up, aren't we? Uh, we, we are not going to fix this. God is not going to fix this here. He has saved our spirit. He is saving our soul. And one day he will save our bodies. He said in the end he will give us life even in our mortal bodies. He's going to save me from this dying flesh. It will be the Holy Spirit through the grace of Jesus Christ. One day he's going to save me even in my inward flesh. Since we're so broken and we're so messed up, how can Scripture and how can Paul say, there is therefore now no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus? How can he say that? How can he say there is no condemnation, not, not just God's condem condemnation, but not other people's condemnation and not your own personal condemnation? Listen, lady at the well, you're guilty as hell. You are, you are, you deserve hell. Listen, 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 lady that's been dragged here by the Pharisees and thrown at my feet. This, you, you are in adultery. You're caught in adultery. You, you are, you are one of the four categories. You're in sexual sin. You're in adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, and lewdness. And, and, and they throw her at Jesus' feet, and the law is brought up. The law came through Moses, but Jesus bent down in the sand and began to write grace and truth. Yeah, you're guilty. Yes, you're an adulterer. Yes, you're a fornicator. Yes, you're lewd. Yes, you're unclean. But then he asked her, lady, when he writes this all this truth out in the soil and the Pharisees are standing there and they said he was without sin. She said he was without sin. Won't you throw the first rock? There was only one man standing there that had the authority to throw a rock. And what was his rock? His rock was, hey ma'am, lift your head up. Where are your accusers? Where are your condemners? And the only person who had the authority to throw the rock said these words, Neither do I condemn you. Who do you think you are condemning yourself, beating yourself up? Who do you think you are throwing rocks at your reflection in the mirror? Who do you think you are throwing rocks at your ability or giftings? Or who do you think you are that you are to pick up a rock? Do you really think that you have the ability, the power, the worthiness, or the authority to pick up a rock and throw it at yourself? When Jesus said, where's your condemners? How can, how can Scripture say, how can Paul say, how can Jesus say, there is therefore now no condemnation, Therefore, no condemnation, legal term, not guilty, gavel, hammer, this baby's over, not guilty. How can it say that? Why is there no condemnation when we sin? Why? It seems like the justice and the right thing would be, and it's amazing how we dispense justice. We want a can of justice to spray other people, but we don't want a can of justice to spray us. If the can of justice sprayed us, all of us would go to hell because that's what's just and that's what's fair. You do not want fairness. You do not want justice. You want the blood of Jesus to drip off you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that when a righteous God looks at you and shows you his goodness, he sees you as the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not someone who's full of brokenness and adultery and fornication and hatred and envy and jealousy and outbursts and drunkenness and a sorcery and idolatry and heresies and dissension and murder and selfish ambition and evilness and lewdness and uncleanness so when he looks at you, he can say, where's your accusers? You are counted in that group of people. 
Stop accusing yourself of things that Jesus has set you free from. You say, yeah, but I'm still doing it. He has set you free from the law of sin and death, not death and sin. Listen to me. You will die and you will sin. He set you free from the law of sin and death. He did not set you free from death and he did not set you free from sin. You will die and you will sin. But now that you are set free from the law of sin and death, you will live for eternity in the presence of God in an unbroken state, completely healed, completely whole, and completely set free. That day will come, but it is not here. It will happen when you're in the presence of your creator. So why can he say there's no condemnation? Here's the shocking truth about grace. Because God does not expect you to stop sinning. Why does God say there's therefore no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus? Because God does not expect you to stop sinning. He knows you can't. The only person who expects you to stop sinning is you because you're ignorant. The only person that expects me to stop sinning is me because I am ignorant. But Jesus knows you will not and you cannot stop sinning, and that's why you need him. If you could stop sinning, you would not need Christ. <sighs> Listen to me, I'll say that one more time just in case those in the back didn't hear me. God does not expect you to stop sinning. That's why he sent Jesus Christ to die for you, because he knew you could not do it. That's what the law showed. That's what the whole point of of the law in the Old Testament shows is that you could not stop sinning. That was the whole point. Condemnation is about us. Grace is about Jesus. The enemy wants us to focus on who? Not Jesus. The enemy wants you to focus on you. And a lot of you are so self-focused that all you do is condemn yourself and condemn others. Pick up a rock, Jack, and if you're without sin, go ahead and start chunking. But since you're not Lay the rock down. Stop beating people up with the word of Jesus, the word of God. I don't think Jesus likes when we use his father's word to beat his father's children, and that includes the person in your mirror. Stop taking the word of God and using it to condemn yourself. Condemnation is an eviction from the presence of God. Conviction is an invitation into the presence of God. So if something you're doing is pushing you away from God, you're self-condemning. If something you're doing is drawing you towards the Father for in repentance and forgiveness and need for his, his, his grace, that is conviction. Conviction draws you. Conviction magnetizes you. It draws you into the presence of God. Condemnation repulses you. It pushes you. It evicts you from the presence of God. The enemy wants us to focus on us, to accuse us and say, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? Why can't you stop? You said you would. You told God you could. You haven't read your Bible. You're still in that same sin you were in 15 years ago. You, 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 you. Because that evil beep, Lucifer only focuses on himself. He wants his followers to focus on themselves because the fruit of Satan is selfish ambition, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, envy, dissension, murder, drunkenness, revelries, adultery, sorcery, heresies. And the fruit of the Satan is that you would self-condemn yourself and think about me, 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 me. Why am I like this? What's wrong with me? I can't, I won't, I don't. If I hear that, that is not about God. That's about me. When grace draws me, it says, this is about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. And the problem with all of this is Satan is telling the truth. There is something wrong with us. But the, the twist, the lie is this, that you can do anything about it. You can't do anything about it. You are broken. God doesn't expect me to stop sinning. God expects me to yield to his spirit because he knows I can't stop. And this is why Paul says, I can't be a good person. Goodness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Goodness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
I'm not good. If, if I'm doing something good, it's because the Holy Spirit decided to work through me. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Come on, I got to get you out of here, but Romans chapter... Man, I want to... There's so much more here. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And that is the exact opposite of the four categories of sin up there. <laughs> love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness is, is certainly the exact opposites of contention, jealousies, outbursts, wrath, selfish ambition, envy, hatred. And those are, those are not fruits of Doug. Those are fruits of the Holy Spirit. So when those come out, that's, that's me walking in the Holy Spirit and not in the flesh. Paul is saying, I can't be a good person. Goodness is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is not about us. This is not about me. This is about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So here's the last scriptures, and I'm going to pray for you. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not in Doug Bell, has made me free from the law of sin and death. Not from sin, I still sin. Not from death, I'm still going to die. But I am free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending it. What the law could not do, God did. What Doug cannot do, God did. What the law could not do, God did. What Doug could not do, God did. For what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh, God already did. By sending his own son in the likeness of flesh on the account of sin, he condemned not Doug, not Dustin, not Kelly, not Jan, not Sharon, not Raymond, not Neil. He didn't condemn us. He condemned sin in my flesh. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person listening and every person watching that while guilt, shame, and condemnation beat us up torturously because we know the truth about who we are, what we do, how we think, how we act, what we hide, what we delete, what we clear, what we sneak around, what we do in front of, we know how broken we are, we know how angry we get, we know how high we are with the Lord one minute and how low we are with the next. We know, we know, we know, we know, we know, we know all this. But the truth is, I am a child of God. And what will save me from this body of death? But you, Holy Spirit. Through the grace of you, Jesus Christ. I am not my own. I am bought with a price. I am a Holy Ghost filled man. It is not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ who lives in me. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is alive and well in me. Thank you, Father. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, give us that in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Wouldn't it be nice, Tasha, if knowing something... Uh, gave us the ability to do something. That's exactly why Adam and Eve took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They thought that knowing good and evil would give them the power to do good and the strength to avoid evil so that they could be like God. And that's what we're doing every day through self-condemnation and some of our Bible studies and some of this self-punishment, thinking that knowing something and doing something are the same. Um, the problem with Adam and Eve thinking they could do something to be like God is that they were already like him. And that is the same truth of you and I. In the spirit where we're saved, and the only part of us that will not die, we're already like him, and the other two will never be like him. My soul and my body. And those are the two things that we tend to focus on far too much because those two are going to be deleted. 
and we're going to be given a new. Uh, so this is a big topic. Um, but stop throwing rocks at yourself and stop throwing rocks at others. And this is going to take time. It's going to not be today. This is a journey of following. Man, yeah, Tasha, I wish that knowing something was the same as being able to do something. Love you guys. I'll see you back tomorrow. I can't wait to see y'all. And this weekend we're going to talk about hearing God. I think it's part four, maybe part five. And since January is like 17 weeks, it might be part 10. But we're going to talk about hearing God. Bye, everybody.